welcome. Sarah asks that you join her in a moment of remembrance to her father. Thank you. So a very warm thank you to all of you and to Bob and Annette and, and Barry and really everyone who helped make the wedding up here happen. There were a lot of hands in this. Yes, and we are so excited to be doing this here. Doing this here today on September 8th, which is the 20th anniversary from the day that we met. Third grade, the first day we spoke. I haven't shut up since. Mm. <laughs> now you may have noticed by now there's no priest here or, or no officiant. That's because we wanted to take as much of an active part in this as we could. We know it's not necessarily traditional, but nothing about this relationship really has been. <laughs> so today, uh, with all of your love in the air to support us, we are taking a big step toward our future by looking back on our story, by remembering and honoring our past. A past that was born out of countless late night phone calls, AIM chat rooms, RIP, yes. hundreds of notes, years of mixed messages, mixed signals, and bad timing. Such bad timing. <laughs> So in that spirit, we cobbled together a book report of sorts for you. And there will be a test. <laughs> Tying together some of the old notes we exchanged, our old journal entries, and just a little background, and some notable quotables to set the stage for you today. Because somehow, after all of these years, and so many hurt feelings, missed opportunities, and a total face plants, We kept circling back to each other. So guys... You're up. Just wow us, no pressure, it's just the biggest day of our lives, and you're being recorded. <laughs> good side. Good, good side. John and Sarah got engaged on the phone almost two years ago after a series of late night cross country calls. But their story goes back so much further. Over the next few minutes, we're going to tell it for you, chapter by chapter, using their own words from notes, journal entries, and a few quotations that mean a lot to them. So listen up, class. <laughs> Chapter one, what's a platypus? <laughs> she realized at last how much she wanted him, no matter what his past was, no matter what he had done, which was not to say that she would ever let him know, but only that he moved her chemically more than anyone she had ever met, that all men, other men seemed pale beside him. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Sarah and John met in the third grade when my mom moved us um, from Welches to St. Therese. Sarah has told me so many times of the instantaneous spark she felt. Like John was a memory of someone familiar before she ever got to know him. For John, the writing wasn't on the wall. He was in puppy love with Audrey Germer, another girl. One day, John began making fun of the new tall stranger in their class. Some light name calling, like Hold platypus, me. to be specific. Sarah's mom called John's mom immediately, and John was told to apologize. But then a funny thing happened. They started talking. First it was through notes, where Sarah gave advice about Audrey while pretending to be just a friend, and she quickly became John's sounding board for all things girls. A typical note from Sarah went something like this. Dear John, you said that you don't think it's fair for me to listen to you talk about Audrey. I enjoy talking to you about any issues that are worrying you, whether it's Audrey, friends, basketball, or just life in general. We can talk, and that is what is so cool. You are so special to me. Your calls, letters, and most of all, your friendship. Don't worry, I'm your friend. Keyword, friend. And that's all I want to be. Sarah Hunt, P.S. Please write back ASAP. Don't let selfish people.
people get you down, but if they do, call me, or call me just because. 503-341-9121 or 503-288-2175. Oh, and I'll have a home phone soon, 503-622-6848. Megan. John and Sarah realized that they had finally found someone that they could trust. There's a huge spider on you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start over. <laughs> it flows better. So John and Sarah realized that they had finally found someone that they could trust entirely, and they ran with it. They told each other everything and kept those secrets like gold. They learned that friendship breeds trust, and trust breeds intimacy and respect. Now for Sarah, though, it was tough to hide her interest. Dear John, you are a great friend. You have stood by me through thick and especially through thin. You are such a wonderful, nice, caring, loving, and sweet person. You also have a big heart, and I trust you a lot, probably more than you think. I know whatever I talk to you about or write to you is between us, for the most part. Unless your sister finds it. <laughs> I would never do anything to hurt you and never ever do anything to make you feel bad. You are so special to me. Your calls, letters, and most of all, your friendship. I'll always stand up for you, no matter what. I'll be there. I look forward to always knowing you. Your friend. Sarah. John, on the other hand, was a little slow to connect the dots. <laughs> At times he thought that maybe Sarah liked him, but she always managed to make him believe her when she said that she just wanted to be friends. Actors. A typical <laughs> journal entry from John went something like this. I'm really glad that Sarah doesn't like me in that way. <laughs> If she did, I think it would make things really complicated. Everyone was saying she does. That's why she's always guarding me when we play basketball. <laughs> no offense, but that seems pretty stupid. <laughs> what is she supposed to do? Let me score all the time? <laughs> so everyone left school thinking I like Sarah. It's no use trying to convince anyone otherwise. I mean, is it so unheard of for a boy and a girl to be friends? So what if we talk on the phone for three hours at a time? That's what you do with friends. You talk. If it weren't for Sarah, I would want things to go back to the way they were. But I would lose something. Something that doesn't come to you often. A best friend. Chapter 3, Landlines and Pillow Talk. To have faith is to trust yourself to the water. When you swim, you don't grab hold of the water, because if you do, you will sink and drown. Instead, you relax and float. Alan Watts. Sarah's secret feelings eventually steered John away from other girls. In the meantime, a new friendship flourished. Between 5th and 8th grade, the notes and phone calls got longer a lot longer. John kept a daily journal, and nearly every one of those entries ended with either a recap of the latest chat with Sarah, or some disappointment that the two of them didn't connect. As the phone bill grew, their families started taking note, sometimes running interference or even inserting themselves entirely into the conversation. One day, John wrote, I called to talk to Sarah, but her mom answered the phone and just kept talking. <laughs> <laughs> Another day, he was quite upset. I think Sarah called, but Mom wouldn't let me talk to her. She doesn't get how much talking with Sarah means to me. These calls tied up the landline for hours. Siblings couldn't use the dial-up internet. Families couldn't use their phones. John even managed to draw fire from Sarah's grandma after one too many late-night phone calls. He wrote, <laughs> I called Sarah around 10.30 p.m. and got a lovely lecture from her grandma about how she can't take calls after nine, but she let me talk a little with her anyway. 
Thank you, Annette. <laughs> Eventually, they took to waiting until their families had gone to bed, hiding the phones under their pillows if a parent came in to check on them. They couldn't get enough of each other. Conversations would go on for hours. Their record was eight hours. They hung up at sunrise, put on their uniforms, and gave each other a groggy wave an hour later at school. Those talks were the highlight of their days. They would wait for everyone to fall asleep just so they could pass a few hours untouched in each other's company. They were learning what it feels like to have a true partner, someone who fills you up and motivates you through it all. And after dancing around the subject, they finally admitted that maybe, just maybe, they liked each other. <laughs> From John's journal. I talked with Sarah today. She wanted to make sure that we'd always be friends. She was worried that because we were both like each other now, if one of us, in the future, doesn't anymore, would we stay friends? I told her that nothing she could do would ever make me not want to be her friend. With her, I don't really have to be different. I can just be myself. It's nice to have someone you can always count on. She's a really great person. I like Sarah, but it's not love. <laughs> not yet, anyway. For the next chapter, it's Bussy and Jim. This love is actually part of you. It is always flowing through you. It's like the subatomic texture of the universe, the dark matter that connects everything. When you tune into that flow, you will feel it in your own heart. Not your physical heart or your emotional heart, but your spiritual heart. The place you point to in your chest when you say, I am. Ram Das. John and Sarah had momentum now. When school let out, they stayed in touch over the summer, checking in at every chance. They recharged each other's dreams, ideas, and sense of identity. When seventh grade started up, they hit the ground running. At my 12th birthday party, John and Sarah <laughs> sat together on the couch and shared this moment captured later in John's journal. <laughs> James's party was off the hook! <laughs> It was so, um, romantic. <laughs> Everyone was telling me to put my arm around Sarah. So I asked her, and she said she didn't care. But I think she wanted me to. They were offering us lots of money to do it. <laughs> so I asked her again and again, and she said, you can do it if you don't take the money. So I did. Everyone cheered and oohed and odd and stuff like that. Morgan wrote, Sarah and John equals heart on one of the dollar bills, ripped it in half, and gave us each a piece. <laughs> I think this might be the beginning of something very special. A little slow indeed, but John was catching on. Sarah passed him a letter at school the following Monday. Dear John, First of all, I'm really glad that all of our cards are out on the table. Are you? Also, I enjoyed having your arm around me. Like I said, it felt safe. The more I think about it, the less awkward it felt. What part of the party would you stay in if it was the only moment that would last forever? Mine would probably be the couch. Yeah, <laughs> it would be the couch. <laughs> Secondly, I'm happy that it's not awkward between us and that everything's the same. Knock on wood, your friend, comma, who might be more, comma, Sarah Hunt. <laughs> Next is John and Rob. So I forgot to say something at the beginning, but the rings that I passed around on the twine, um, Sarah and John wanted you both, everybody here, to be as much a part of their union as your family. And so as the rest of the ceremony goes around, keep passing it around and putting your love into them. Thank you. All right, on that note. <laughs> Chapter five, some people wait a lifetime. And I choose you. In a hundred lifetimes, in a hundred worlds, in any version of reality, I'd find you and I'd choose you. The chaos of stars. Sarah, the friend who might be more, quickly got her wish. 
Between seventh and eighth grade, she and John racked up a few big firsts. First dance, first kiss, and first time dating. From, from John's journal again in 2002. The snowball dance was like James's party times five. We danced on the first slow song to that new Kelly Clarkson song, A Moment Like This. I don't know about Sarah, but something happened tonight that was really good. When they turned on the lights, I think neither of us wanted to leave. We were very happy where we were. We hugged, and it was a long, good, great, warm, cozy, fun, special, kind of romantic, sad that we had to go, we kind of like each other kind of hug. <laughs> she is so amazing. She's really smart. She has a great voice. She's beautiful. She has a really good sense of humor. And she has something that just makes you want to melt. I really like her. I wonder if I should have kissed her. <laughs> John, you really should have kissed her. <laughs> Fortunately, not too long after that, Sarah stepped up and made her move at the next birthday party. John wrote about it later. Audrey dared Sarah and I to kiss at Eric's party. I was too nervous. I've never kissed anyone. But then, before I knew it, Sarah just walked right up and kissed me, right there in front of everybody. <laughs> Dang, it was nice. Yes. <laughs> and so much easier than I thought. Then, someone dared us to do seven minutes in heaven in the closet. I won't write about that, though. <laughs> that kiss sealed the deal. They soon started dating, and Sarah couldn't wait to tell John exactly how she felt. From Sarah's journal, 2003. I called John today. I love him so much, but I can't tell him because I don't want to pressure him into anything. I said, it, I said it once, but he really couldn't say it back, for understandable reasons. But I, really st I, really, I still really want him to. I hope that he will say it soon because I want, him, I want to be able to tell him again. Meanwhile, John was pretty focused on getting his second kiss. <laughs> Sarah and I are going out now. She said she loves me, and I was like, oh boy. I was truly speechless. <laughs> she was expecting an I love you in return, but I told her I don't want to give her anything until I'm completely sure. But I have a girlfriend. It's really cool. <laughs> I think I'm going to get to kiss her again. She thinks my odds are more than maybe and possibly, which is good. So I think I'm going to do it sometime soon. Not sure when, but soon. And Miriam and Mike will continue this. <laughs> The only way to make sense out of change is to plunge into it, move with it, and join the dance. Alan Watts. Chapter 6, The X Factor. As these th things tend to do, summer went by and trying to date seemed so much more complicated than that simple piece of solace they found as friends. John pulled Sarah aside at recess, where all the major life conversations were allowed to take place, and told her that he thought friendship was probably a better path for them. He used the dreaded B word, breakup. Despite her surprise and heartache, even the breakup letters were alive with compassion and mutual respect. Sarah wrote on September 8, 2003. Dear John, I just thought that I should apologize for what everyone is asking you about us breaking up. I shouldn't have told anyone anything about it, but I was just hurt or well more confused because I didn't really think that you were going to tell me that. I'm really, really sorry for them constantly bugging you about it. If you want to talk, you can call me at 503-665-6884, but I'm at my dad's until Wednesday. Just because you don't like me that way anymore doesn't mean that we have to lose that friendship that we had and still have. Sarah Hunt. P.S. Reich back, or WB, if you want to. If you don't, then well, no pressure. Also, I would appreciate it if you didn't share this note with anyone. Thanks. Chapter 7. Let's not say we did. Muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. Alan Watts. They followed each other from St. Therese to LaSalle High School, but they didn't really interact. Sarah thought John was too flighty, and John felt like Sarah was too serious. Over four years, they had a lot of classes together, but not very many moments. And yeah, sometimes it was real awkward. <laughs> At one point in their junior year, it seemed like the clouds were parting, and just maybe they were getting their timing right. 
but John decided against it before the wheels got off the ground. Before Sarah left for tour and John for Gonzaga, it just wasn't in the cards. Jacob. Chapter eight, let's get this show on the road. I can do nothing for you but work on myself. You can do nothing for me but work on yourself, Ram Das. This will they or won't they plot played out well into adulthood. They kept trying, failing, trying again. They faced long distance and hurt feelings. Along the way, they saw each other's worst selves, the hurt self and the angry self, the I love you so much, but why can't you love me too self? Despite this unbelievably frustrating pattern, when the chips were down, they reached out to each other. If it wasn't a phone call on the heels of a major life crisis, then there were always the smoke signals, a little, hi, I'm here, are you there, I'm thinking about you, or I loved you on that TV show last night, congrats. Holy crap, you just graduated. I knew you could do it, my friend. John was a direct line to that feeling of home while Sarah was on the road away from friends and family. He was always on speed dial and got calls from stairwells, buses, airports, hotel rooms, dressing rooms. He called her at major crossroads, like the time he left law school unsure about his path and the nature of reality. When one called, the other always picked up, always. In 2010, Sarah came home for an extended summer. Finally, in the same time zone again, they tried to pick up where they left off. Ironically, it was Sarah this time who put on the brakes. She told him she just wasn't ready, and he was crushed. But somehow, channeling their younger selves, they worked through their toughest time yet with honest and direct communication, respect, hope, a little bit of humor, and a whole lot of love. So I will hand it over to John and Sarah now. <laughs> Chapter 9. Friends don't let friends break up. Write like you're a damn death row inmate, and the governor is out of the country, and there's no chance for a pardon. <coughs> Write like you are clinging to the edge of a cliff, white knuckles on your last breath, and you've got just one last thing to say. Like you're a bird flying over us, and you can see everything, and please, for God's sake, tell us something that will save us from ourselves. Take a deep breath, and tell us your deepest, darkest secret, so we can wipe our brow and know that we are not alone. Alan Watts. Here are those breakup notes from 2010. Sarah, I've taken some time to think and I just want to put everything out there. You mean the world to me right now. My morning, my afternoon, my night, all the stuff I do throughout the day, you're with me, though you're not at all with me. You kind of crept up on me, snuggled up close and wormed your way right into my heart. Knowing everything we talked about, I have no right to be upset. I know you can't have a relationship right now. I know being 3,000 miles apart is not practical. You were honest and upfront from the get-go. That being said, I'm still hurt. It seems like you already knew how you felt about me. <laughs> you may have loved me for longer than just these past few months. My thinking is that somehow this makes things less exciting on your end, or easier to walk away from, maybe. This is decidedly not so in my case. You totally caught me off guard. I fell in love with you. A totally new, fresh feeling for me. Naturally, I got carried away. It's just who I am. I got to thinking about New York visits and all the ways we'd stay in touch. I was just overrun with the idea that my feelings somehow changed everything. It's humbling to see they don't move mountains and they cannot shrink vast gaps. To me, this kind of feels like the breakup of a relationship that never really was. I understand you need time alone to recharge your batteries, get back to being Sarah, and I want you to do what's best for you. You have my full support. I want to be your friend. I'll be there for you however I can be. You've carved yourself a very solid, very special place in my heart. If life and my experiences with you have taught me anything, it's that ours is a fire that never really dies. It'll come back if it's supposed to. I don't know when we'll talk next, but I look forward to it. Hope all is well. John. John. I apologize I didn't give you an immediate response, but I wanted to read your letter a couple times and really think about it before writing back. And even now, after a couple of days, I still don't know what to say, but I so desperately want to say something, anything, that I am going to try my best. For starters, I am sorry, period. You have no right, you, you've, you're right to a degree. I've always known how I felt about you. This whirlwind that summer was for you was not to me based on new, unfamiliar feelings that one day just happened to creep up on me. 
So I'm sorry that my already established feelings have tugged and pulled at yours to leave you where you are now. Hurt, maybe a little confused, and maybe feeling a little foolish. I say that only because last time when I was on the other end, that's what my experience was. But on that same note, please understand how hard it was for me to tell you that this relationship is not in the cards right now. Nine years wanting you to reciprocate something, and when it finally comes, I have to say no. That's sucky all around. And to clarify, I am not asking you to hold on to these feelings you have. I'm happy we both experienced them, and at the same time, big deal for us, but for me, that's good enough for now. We are, in fact, capable of being on the same page after all. Now, with that said, I like very much the idea of our relationship being a flame that never really dies. It just takes on different levels of intensity on occasion and every now and again changes its colors. You're always going to be in my life, and vice versa. In what respect, I don't know, but I'm not going to fret about that for now. I'm just happy to have been able to experience you in a totally different way for a moment or two and to be able to see you sans barriers and to be seen in return. You are a very special man, Mr. Fuhr. I really hope you know that, and if all else fails, I know that, and you will figure it out eventually. <laughs> I think I'm gonna end this note here. Just for simplicity's sake, rambling is the crux to the core of me. Know that you are loved, know you are respected, and please, please know that this is not a breakup. I get the metaphor, but I refuse to break up with you before we've been properly dated. I'll talk to you soon. I hope everything's going well and that you haven't been attacked by spiders like Megan. XO. <laughs> Sarah. Chapter 10. Be here now. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Chinese proverb. At the end of 2016, despite not talking much the past couple of years, I reached out and just so happened to mention I was coming home for the holidays. In spite of the recent radio silence, I responded enthusiastically. I also told her I was in a really good place and warned her that she was walking into a trap. I was stymied by his honesty, attracted to it, but reassured him once again that I only wanted to see him as a friend. I knew what was about to happen. I told him to pick me up from my aunt and uncle's and we would go to Peacock Lane. In true Sarah fashion, she did not pick up her phone when I called. I waited outside for like half an hour. I felt really bad, um, but to be fair, you easily could have knocked on the door. Could have answered your phone. True. Anyway, um, I went out and I got him when I realized he was in fact there. So I told him to come up and say hi while I grabbed my stuff. From there, Aunt Kathy lured me into the kitchen with the promise of pizza and dessert, which 75 pounds ago was difficult to turn down. And instead of a quick hi and goodbye, we just lingered. Here we hadn't seen each other in almost four years. And somehow there we were again, sharing space. I told John after that I had this tingle of a premonition as we sat across the table from each other that night, eating and chatting with my family, as if no time had passed, as if somehow we had always been together. So we left Barry and Kathy's and drove around looking at the lights and talked until five in the morning. There was no doubt that everything we had built Decades of communication, belief, and trust had finally come into season. We had finally come into season. Less than two months later, we were engaged, and now here we are. <laughs> Those same two kids, trusting each other, challenging each other, teasing each other. Still friends, still talking, still dreaming, still laughing, just like those first days of school. Here on our first day of marriage. <laughs> Chapter 11 is Who Has the Rings? <laughs> back here. You want to get her up here? Mary, will you come up here and make this thing legal? <laughs> All right, you two. Please take each other's hands. And all of you out there, please take hands. Please join hands. Sarah and John, take a good look at your partner's hands. These are the hands of your best friend, holding yours on your wedding day. These are the hands that will work alongside yours as together you build your future. These note writing, kitty petting, LA traffic driving, 
These are the hands you reach out to when you are in need, struggling, lost. These hands are your compass, your horizon. These are the hands that will hold you for all of this lifetime. And these are the hands that when wrinkled and aged will still be reaching for yours. This is the point in the ceremony when people usually talk about the wedding bands being a perfect circle, having no beginning and no end. But we all know that these rings have a beginning. Rock is dug up from the earth. Metals are liquefied in a furnace at a thousand degrees. The hot metal is forged, cooled, and then painstakingly polished. Something beautiful is made from raw elements. Love is like that. It comes from humble beginnings, made by imperfect beings. It is the process of making something beautiful where there was once nothing at all. John, please place this ring on Sarah's finger and repeat after me. Sarah, I take you for now and for always. Sarah, I take you for now and for always. My sweetest confidant. My sweetest confidant. My dearest friend. My dearest friend. You are my forever. You are my forever. Sarah, please place this ring on John, on, on John's finger and repeat after me. John, I take you for now and for always. John, I take you for now and for always. My sweetest confidant. <laughs> My sweetest confidant. I'm sorry. <laughs> My dearest friend. My dearest friend. You are my forever. You are my forever. I would like everyone here to please close your eyes. Everyone and focus all of your love, energy, thoughts of help and happiness, of lives lived passionately and courageously, of dreams manifested into realities, of two lives lived in the spirit of grace and gratitude, of partnership and laughter, of imagination and trust, and friendship sent all of that light and love to John and Sarah here on their wedding day in these sacred woods. You can open your eyes now. Thank you. Sarah and John, no one but you can declare yourselves married. You have done it here today in speaking your vows before your family and friends, and you will continue to do it in the days and years to come, standing by and reveling in each other in all of life's adventures. On behalf of your family, your friends, and the power invested by me by the state of Oregon, I am so happy to congratulate, to say congratulations to John and Sarah. You are now husband and wife. to take a picture with all of you right now. Yes. So bridal party, get over there. Yeah, this take way. a large group shot. Um, there's water over there. Uh, yeah, we're going to start there. taking some pictures, and we want you all to go back to the reception hall and start drinking up. Okay. <laughs>